Uh, so good morning everybody. Thank you for joining us here at uh, our first panel in the DevNet Zone. Uh, so we're here to talk about the Internet of Things. And we have a very uh, distinguished audience here this morning to, to talk about uh, their future in terms of what they see is happening in the Internet of Things. What are some of the challenges and what are some of the different products that we have. Um, so, uh, so what we're going to do is get started. Let me ask some of you, what fields do all of you work in? So how many of you are working in the Internet of Things? How many of you are thinking about building practices in the Internet of Things? Thinking about it? Okay. Uh, so how many of you are just here to learn about the new technology advances and the new directions in the industry? Okay, fantastic, great. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, panel, uh, I would like uh, each of you to please uh, introduce yourselves briefly and what you do here at Cisco. Hi, I'm John Apostolopoulos. I'm the VP CTO for the enterprise segment, and I also lead uh, something we call the Innovation Labs. We try to focus on various strategic problems for Cisco, and a big area we work on is IoT because of its importance for society and for Cisco. Hi, uh, Lionel Hunt. I'm actually a manager of technical marketing. I lead a team of engineers out in San Jose, and I work on IoT software, so the core capability of actually connecting these things to the internet. My name is Marcia Krantz. Uh, I run a um, uh, strategic innovation group at Cisco, which basically means incubating new businesses, uh, co innovation, innovation centers, internal innovation. In the spare time, I also wrote a book about IoT. Uh, I'm Steve Grish. I run a program called IOX in Cisco. This solves the last mile problem for IoT, and uh, I will talk about it a little later. And I'm Sean Cooley. I'm the CTO for IoT and industry. Can you hear? Are these speakers here working? Uh, sorry, okay, are our speakers working now? Okay. Have to go again. We can hear you now. <laughs> oh, you can hear me? Okay, can you uh, say hello, Sean? Hi, uh, Sean Cooley. Can you, can hear, you hear Sean? Yeah, maybe, no? No. A little low? Hello, can you hear Sean now? <laughs> How about now? Is it better? All right. Okay, now lightning range, uh, lightning speed introductions, Sean. <laughs> uh, Sean Cooley, CTO for IoT and Industries at Cisco. Okay, uh, Sri Krish. Sri Krish, uh, IOX, I run IOX program in Cisco. Machek Brand, Strategic Innovations. <laughs> Lionel Hunt, IoT Software. <laughs> John Baslopoulos, CTO Enterprise Segment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can folks hear now? Are we good? We're getting better? Okay, uh, so, uh, so now we all know that there's been such a huge promise for IoT. Um, so, and every year it's promised and promised and promised, and now people are kind of interested in it. So tell us, like, what has changed about IoT over the last year? Is it different from it what, from what it was one year ago to what it is today? And you can go in sure. any order. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, for us, the biggest change is security, right? I mean, the the attacks that we've seen with the Mirai botnet uh, that Ruba just talked about on stage uh, really changed the conversation that we've been having in IoT. Uh, especially with government agencies. Government agencies concerned about the deployments of IoT and how they'll be secured as we move forward. Great. Yeah, from my perspective, I think uh, it's becoming more real. The, like a lot of the hardware, especially in the connectivity side, a lot of the hardware we, in last one year, we came here like, last Berlin, we talked about IO, I, IOX and uh, connectivity, and we, it's real. It's real. A lot of them are shipping with respect to the uh, connectivity issue. Um, so that's, that's the big change that happened in the last year. I would tend to agree. I, I think what, when we talked last year, we talked about sort of a basic... Uh, I'm sorry, one minute. Can you guys hear? Or are we having trouble? <laughs> uh, maybe we should... Should we spend a couple minutes to work on the audio? Is there something that we can do to fix the audio? He's, I think if we just carry on going, it can adjust. We just carry on. Do, do we have to move these speakers or something? Would it help to move those out a little bit? Okay, going to carry on. All right, Magic. I will speak loudly. Um, <laughs> so, um, if you look at what we discussed last year, if you guys were, were here last year, we talked about IoT, sort of uh, a lot of companies starting at the beginning of a journey, mostly around um, improving existing processes, uh, improving efficiencies, improving productivity, with use cases like um, uh, connected operations, remote asset management, uh, predictive analytics, and so forth. Uh, primarily in the industrial segment and smart cities. What has seen, what we have seen over last year is 
uh, more uh, focus in IoT in some other verticals, like in agriculture, for example, in retail and in healthcare. So much broader focus. Okay, um, I'm, from my side, I mean, I spend a lot of time in the field with customers and in actually engaging in the front line. And the stuff's becoming real, you know, like Shri Krish said, what we are seeing though is people are actually trying to connect more things than they ever imagined. So they're running into scaling issues, they're running into challenges at, around actually doing these deployments, connecting, everything like that as well. So those are the main things from a vertical point of view. It is actually becoming across the board, you know, I think we as Cisco, a lot of times we're saying, well, we're going to try and go after these vertical markets. And we're seeing a true horizontal play now. You know, every single customer that I talk to, they want an IoT type solution in almost everything that they're working on. Yeah, in addition to what my colleague said, uh, two other things that are happening is, for example, smart buildings are really going to take off. If you saw Aruba's keynote, you saw some of the work with digital ceiling, that brings significant benefits for OpEx and CapEx right away to make you interact with the building from true energy and so forth. Another thing is connected vehicles. If you think about it, a couple years ago, very few people would talk about connected vehicles, besides for very high-end cars like Tesla. Now you hear it all over the place for cars, for Uber, and so forth. That's another area that's really beginning to, to explode recently. Excellent, so there's uh, so many use cases, and you guys have already mentioned a few of the use cases here. Do you have any more use cases to add, or should we uh, continue on? Are there other use cases beyond the ones we just talked about? I think we could spend an entire day just talking about use cases for IoT. <laughs> 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 well, let's move on. Let's just say, you know, what's needed in the industry to make IoT real? So we have certainly point-wise solutions in IoT where you can do your home thermostat or, you know, kind of have your fitness tracker. But what's really needed to make IoT real in the industry? So, so I think when we look at industries and we try to figure out how we're going to make IoT real in them, it's, it's about working backwards, right? We, we have to start with the outcome that we're looking for. Uh, you know, Cisco sells obviously a lot of components, as do most of the partners that we work with. Uh, and it's really hard to show up with a box of components and then figure out how you're going to apply them. It's better to start with what am I trying to achieve, how am I going to improve my business, and then work back to what components are necessary to build that, right? And so, for us, it's really about the outcomes. Nice. Yeah, so from uh, more on the tactical side, right? Like, you know, one is, uh, this is more strategy overall, uh, bringing it right together. But from the tactical side, one of the challenges people face, I think uh, me and uh, Leonel were talking about this before this, the end-to-end -end, the last mile connectivity is something uh, a lot of the other customers who are only playing in the cloud could not solve it, and Cisco can come and solve this problem. And how to connect the data to the cloud is something like you know, uh, Leonel is working on, and that's something uh, it's critical, and that's been like you know, one of the challenges we are solving. I would, I would echo these statements. Uh, I think what's, what is needed, so from the technology perspective, uh, there are a bunch of efforts around standards uh, from data framing perspective and others. Uh, how do we make sure that, uh, that the new sensors would speak the same language, right? That uh, we, uh, you, right now you have a lot of efforts, a lot of startups focusing on uh, building platforms, and I hate the term, but uh, basically just to get the sensors to, uh, uh, to, um, to uh, uh, start uh, exchanging information. A lot of focus, as Sean mentioned before, on security, and I think the good things are starting to happen there. Um, but also, I think that what's important also is thinking about the capabilities from the channel perspective, integration, so that we can start seeing uh, IoT adopted not only in a large enterprise, but also small and medium-sized enterprises. And last but not least, also I think the change in the business structure. So moving from the model of vertically integrated, one company does it all sort of a approach into open ecosystem based on open standards, multiple companies working together on a joint solution. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, you can answer this question in so many ways. Um, you know, like Sean said, outcomes based. A lot of times I sit in front of a customer, I don't actually talk about the technology at all. I'll say, hey, what's the problem you're trying to solve? You know, and they'll say, well, I'm actually trying to get my truck drivers a better experience so they don't actually leave within six months because it costs me a lot of money to actually train my truck drivers. Well, from a technology point of view and through IoT, how do we actually enable that? How do you enable that business outcome? You know, you could do a whole bunch of stuff. You can make it easier for him to actually start up the truck. You can give him more data so he, he can actually drive further miles. Things like this because the more miles he drives, the more he gets paid. You know, things like that. We can actually start changing the way 
companies operate at a very fundamental level. One of the other things that we actually work with extensively, you know, like Maciek is saying, driving standardization. Within IoT, even within the same manufacturer, I'll have one machine speaking a certain protocol, and the other machine, because it was manufactured in a different part of the world, speaks a completely different protocol. You know, and we're really working across machine builders, things like that, to try and say, hey, can we actually get a common platform that everybody can talk on, so that in the end, it makes it easier for partners, companies, analytics providers, everything like that, to get access to the data, which is the crown jewels in this a lot of times, you know, trying to turn that data into something that's relevant and usable to drive that business outcome again. Yeah, and to do these outcomes, actually this is where you come into play. Because the customer wants an integrated solution that they can just use to get at their smart build and manufacturing use cases. And all of you together with other partners and, and so can put together that integrated solution is, which is what they want. And also to make this easier for you, another thing is we mentioned all these standards. We currently track, Sean and I, working together, track about 65 different standards organizations, alliances, so forth. Well, and first of all, that's way too much. The thing is very fragmented. So what we're trying to do is trying to guide these together to converge, to have a smaller number of things, recommended reference architectures, which you can use to build those integrated solutions to the customer to give them the outcomes they want. So that's what we're trying to do. So that you can get access to the APIs via DevNet and some of these other standards-based reference platforms uh, and then build those integrated solutions. So uh, we talked about a lot of different factors of what it takes in the industry to make IoT real, but does anybody want to talk about some of the technologies that are needed and what are the technology advancements to make IoT real? Let John start this time. John, go ahead. <laughs> sure, so there, there are a lot of technologies that we're working on here at Cisco across the board to make this possible. From IoT cloud, to fog, to security. Uh, there are a lot of really, uh, 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 cutting edge things being done. Actually, if you want, there's some nice demos here about Smart City right to my, light, uh, our, to my right, your left, as well as IoT automation at scale. Over there, you can go see some examples of the things we're building to make these possible. Um, technologies, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> question. Okay. This can go down into the weeds. Um, fog, obviously, a crucial part of this, being able to connect to these things. But then also the cloud, I mean, I come from a cloud world now, you know, and one of the big drivers is being able to get multiple data sources within even one customer, and actually being able to say, hey, I've got a factory based in Rio, I've got a factory based somewhere in Chile, I've got a factory based in Berlin, and why is one factory operating more efficiently than the other? You know, things like this, and this is what cloud provides us with now as well. Being able to take all these various data sets, combining them up and running analytics on top of that, and actually being able to drive and see what changes and why. I would agree, I think cloud is key, and um, uh, John mentioned fog that a lot of us work on as well. Uh, if you think about sort of the, uh, the evolution of use cases with IoT, what we are seeing is much more real-time or near real-time uh, traffic flow and data flow and the amount of data, right? I mean, that's what these de IoT devices pretty much do, right? They generate data that we need to take, pull, pull into business outcomes. And um, from that perspective, uh, the movement over the last year has been towards this concept of distributed cloud or fog computing, where you actually process the data and perform some of the uh, cloud functions at the edge of the network in conjunction with uh, centralized functions in the cloud. Um, and I think that has been a big change with Open Fog Consortium, with the Fog Reference Architecture. Um, at Cisco, we've done a lot of work in uh, operationalizing our IOX implementation. So, uh, so that's, I would guess, one of the two or three major architectural shifts that we've seen as a result of IoT. Yes. So one thing we did last uh, two weeks back, we met a lot of our developers, and we talked to them, what do they need, right? So this kind of answers the question. Simplicity, right? They are looking for, they come from the world of building applications in Python, Java, and uh, like you know, mostly high-end applications, Node.js, and they want us to like, give a very simple APIs to them, right? Whether it, we, they, don't want to, they want to abstract a lot of this data, whether it's like you know, connected um, uh, the routers, and uh, they don't want to know anything about it, right? They want to write applications, and the APIs should be very simple for them to use, right? And this is where I think you know, 
how we combine together in a vertical way and provided access is critical. So that's 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 one of the things, key things we are getting. Yeah, and then I would just say connectivity, right? I mean, we uh, we hear a lot of customers that come to us and they tell us about the great cloud applications that they've built, uh, and then they go and put one of their sensors in a mine that's you know half a mile underneath the earth, and they can't figure out how to get the data back to that cloud. And so the connectivity piece for us is a really big big piece of the puzzle. Yeah, can I can I say a bit more? Um, you know, we sit up here on the stage and we make it sound super simple. You know, it's like, oh yeah, you just take this gateway, you plug it in, you connect a bunch of sensors and you transmit it to, the, well, transport the data to the cloud. Right. What we're seeing a lot is it's extremely complex. It's actually a difficult problem to solve. And that's one of the big projects that I've been working on with Sean and the rest of the guys is, how do we simplify that? You know, how do we actually make it as simple as, hey, take a gateway, plug it in, and let it dial back home to the cloud, push one of the IOX fog, fog applications down, the partners develop code, and it all of a sudden magically starts transmitting data. Well, we're actually there right now. You know, we can do that. As Cisco, we've actually, for the last 18, 24 months, we've been working really hard to actually simplify that flow, simplify the stack, and being able to get things connected more easily. And yes, there's still a lot of work to do, and we'll carry on iterating on this as well. But we'll get there, and I mean, you can actually see part of the demo on the right-hand side over there as well. So that's, you know, simplification. Just making it completely simple. Remember one of the big challenges that I face specifically with customers, if we're talking IoT, if we're talking industrial IoT, that's the operations technology guys. These are the guys that are absolute geniuses when it comes to machines and pumps and all these crazy things. I know nothing about that world. And they know nothing about our world. So for them it needs to be as simple as, hey, plug this thing in, scan a barcode, and it needs to work magically. And that's where we need to drive and iterate towards. So, Machik, uh, so I have a book here on building the Internet of Things. Uh, Machik over here is the author of this, so you've been uh, in the industry for a long time. So really studying it, talking to lots of customers, building technology, but you put it all together in this book, and this has actually been on, uh, uh, what, number three in the bestseller list for uh, books on the market in IoT. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you've done here in your book? Sure, and I think that, uh, to be honest, I never Can you guys hear Machik? Uh, yes, okay, great. Yeah, I never thought about writing a book, but I think it was three years ago or so, uh, I started getting a lot of questions uh, from business leaders, people that run the businesses, plants, uh, retail stores, and so forth, and said, okay, is there a book on the market that can help us um, think about how we implement IoT, how we start with our first project, how we start on the IoT journey? And at that time, I couldn't find one, so I figured I'll write one. So this book is basically a very much a hands-on guide. Um, not a lot of technology, mostly about use cases and, and practical uh, takeaways from hundreds of implementations of your peers. Um, that uh, what are the use cases you should start with? What are the best practices? What are the mistakes that your peers have made? Um, and then learning from those so that your first project will be a successful one and you can then start be becoming more adventurous and more uh, probably disruptive uh, on your IoT journey. And what I found during the process is, um, and I think we've talked about it before, is that, yeah, there's a lot of technology challenges and simplification and uh, standardization are key, but there are lots of other issues around uh, people and talent, OT, IT issue. Um, it's, a, it's around change management. It's around um, partner ecosystem. Um, it is around uh, connecting solutions with a business process, and in, in most cases, starting with a business process. So, um, so if you want to sort of think about how do I start on the IoT journey, again, from the business perspective and the technology perspective, hopefully you can find the, the answers in the book. Excellent, excellent. Uh, good job on doing Thank that. You. I'm sure it was a lot of effort to put all of that knowledge together in one place. <laughs> and uh, many of you have copies here, is that right? Great. Um, so now let's get into some of the uh, different and more uh, more specific technologies that we're working on. So, so Lionel, what's the role of IoT in the cloud, and what is something called IoT Data Connect? Oh, IoT Data Connect. Um, it's exactly what I was speaking about earlier. Actually, it's it's the ability to take 
a Cisco IR809 or an 829 if we're going to start going down into the weeds. Um, it's actually a platform that runs IOX, being able to actually connect that seamlessly onto the network. Um, what it does is it dials home and it auto provisions itself. There's a nice little UI that normal, we actually designed the whole UI around OT, around a guy that doesn't know anything about IT at all. He doesn't understand what a VLAN is. He doesn't understand what a gigabit ethernet port is or anything like that. And we've gone and simplified that flow completely to allow for you to essentially order the box, ship it out to the customer's site, saving, I think, like a call out fee, usually for an IT guy is about $1,500 to actually send someone to site. All of a sudden you can say, hey, the guy that usually works behind the counter at Starbucks, anything like that, he can take this box, plug it in, it will dial home and it will auto provision. And then lo and behold, you can actually start pushing applications down to that as well to talk to the, the various machines. So that's what I'm working on from a cloud point of view. The reason why, um, we've had a lot of customers that come and said, hey, I want to scale. I want to grow the business. It's really difficult for me. A lot of guys have actually gone and said, oh, I've connected 8,000 machines to the network. That was easy, but as soon as we got to 8,001, my world fell apart. And we thought, well, okay, maybe there's a market there. Maybe we can actually go and help solve a problem. And that's what we went out specifically with the goal of actually solving that scale challenge of connecting all these millions of things into the cloud structure so that you can enable analytics and enable business drivers again. So, uh, you know, so the problem of handling all of that data, yeah. putting it in the cloud or on yeah. the edge is super important. Uh, Shri Krish, uh, you've been working on edge computing in a product that we call IOX to work in that domain. Can you tell us a little bit about sure. that? Uh, one of the key challenges is, like, you know, with, with any IoT is how to get the sensor data to the cloud, right? So to solve that problem, I think this is where Cisco comes in. Cisco is close to the sensor and it's a connectivity, as uh, Sean mentioned, we are in the connectivity business, right? So we'll be able to get this information and what we do is we, write, we let people, partners and customers, write applications that runs on the edge of the network, right? It runs on the routers, switches, servers that are close to the IoT, right? And we provide, we run this on a Docker-ready containers, we'll be able to run it, and this application, it, it, you, do, you go to develop a, de, our developer a DevNet forum, we'll be able to get the SDKs, which you can use it to develop applications that, that gets deployed to the edge of the network, which are routers, where you can process. We provide APIs to you. You'll be able to get the GPS information. If you are putting this in a truck, for example, you'll be able to get the GPS information and process it. And this data goes into uh, IoT Data Connect. From there, you can access in the cloud. So this is like you know, your portal or your entry point into IoT, the application's entry point into IoT. So that's what we do. Yeah, and then How many of you were familiar with IOX before you came here? Just a few of you. So, uh, uh, so that's really important part of our portfolio and how we bring it together. Um, so can I yeah, just add, Sean. So, you know, I mean, when we when we talk about edge computing and the fog, uh, you know, a lot of people hear about the cloud and the cloud and the cloud. There are a lot of use cases that we see every day where either latency is a major concern or bandwidth constraints are a major concern. And so, the ability to do a lot of this compute on the edge and make decisions out locally near the sensors and the actuators in order to, to sort of drive the operation without actually having to involve the cloud. Uh, you know, it, it's growing every single day. And so anything where human safety is involved, uh, you know, vehicle systems driving down the roads, uh, all of these things, you, know, you take an oil rig that's out in the middle of the ocean, it may have very, very limited bandwidth, but it's producing a lot of data. And for it to, to make decisions on that data and actually change uh, the, the way that they run their business without sending it all to the cloud is, is a requirement for fog. And so the, the fog piece is, is becoming more important uh, in every, everything we look at. Yeah, it's, so. it's an interesting one that actually, um, some of the machines that I've been in contact with, if they're actually, if they've got optics or anything like that, so laser sights, anything like that, you know they can have upwards of almost 3,000 sensors just in one machine. They generate locally about 1.5 terabytes worth of data on a workflow per day. You know, that's a lot of data. And, you know what, the service providers will say, sure, send it up to the internet, send it to the cloud because you're going to pay me for that bandwidth. But the reality is, there's a lot of local processing that needs to take place. We actually need to be able to do near real time, sometimes real time decision making locally as well. You know, So being able to push that intelligence down to the edge is crucial for us well, within, I, I think, I, within IoT. Yeah, and also, I mean, if, if you go to a factory owner and tell them, hey, you know, anytime oh. the cloud goes down, your, your factory <laughs> will just come to a stop. Right, like, <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. And so the, the ability for them to, to keep this stuff on premises 
uh, and actually you know, run it and do the compute on-prem uh, without having to rely on the cloud is, is a big deal for them. So, so it's a very good kind of, uh, the data architecture, right, and the yeah. connectivity architecture is all very complex. So yeah. having the devices, having the processing on the edge, having uh, the data that goes back into the cloud. Um, now with all these devices coming on, and Ruba was talking about all the devices coming onto the internet uh, this morning in our keynote, security seems to be a really big issue. So uh, would anyone like Sean have anything to say about security <laughs> for the Internet of Things? Any, anyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, we, uh, Ruba did a really good job of telling the story this morning, um, but as we connect more and more things to the network, and these things are very, very low cost, you know, some of these sensors are sub 50 cents. The amount of engineering effort that went into the securing those 50 cent sensors is fairly low. And so we, we start getting to a point where the network and the things can no longer be adversaries. We've, we've really spent a lot of time where the network sort of has to operate autonomously without caring what's connected to it. And the things try to hide what they're doing from the network by using encryption and then other you know, secure transport mechanisms. And we're really getting to a point where in order for us to actually secure this properly and, and move it forward, we have to have the things in the network work together. And so we've, we've been working on a lot of uh, standards and, and other ways to get the industry to come together. One of them is something that we call manufacturer usage description. Um, and John can, can talk a little bit about, more about MUD, but, but the, way that we, the way that we make these things work with the network really has to change. And so you'll see a lot coming out from Cisco in the, the near future about this, but you want to talk about MUD? Yeah, MUD's a, MUD is a new effort that Cisco's been pushing. And basically what happens is that, as, as Sean mentioned, these devices, these sensors, they're really, really low cost, 50 cents. And for the longest time, the people made these sensors, they wanted them to be secure, but their, the first thing was to make them work. And they didn't really understand security, they didn't really understand networking. So that was kind of lower priority. Nowadays, because of all the DDoS attacks from the baby monitors and digital VCRs and so forth, they really want to make sure that their sensors, their actuators are secure. And the question then is, how do you do that in a way that's cost effective? Because that light bulb costs 50 cents, right? How can you make that secure? And so one of the ways that Cisco came out to do it is something called manufacturer's usage description. And the idea here is that fortunately these devices, such as the light bulb or thermostat or so forth, they have a sole purpose generally, a single purpose. And the manufacturer knows what that purpose is and he can describe it. The manufacturer, he or she can describe it. And the network could learn what that purpose is and learn who that device talks to, uh, who talks to it, and only and enforce that only those sort of communications happen and nothing else. And that can go a very long way to improving the security. And part of the beauty here is the way this works is that that embedded device, that light bulb, all it needs is an embedded URL that points to the MUD description that describes how uh, the network should, uh, what the network's posture should be with that device. To make this even, even clearer, we're used to this today. Whenever you buy some medicine, an aspirin, on the label of the medicine, it describes how you should use it. And that's what teaches you what you should use it for and what you should not use it for. That's what we're doing with, uh, with, I, with the things in IoT now, making something analogous to that. If you want to learn more, there's an IETF draft on manufacturer uses description. And either Sean or I would be very happy to talk with you further. Yeah, and, and just to extend on that, I, you know, the, this, this difference with IoT of them having a sole purpose is really critical here. I mean, if you look at a laptop or a mobile device, right, th these things are general purpose compute devices. They can do anything. It's at the whim of the user. And so for a network, it's really rather difficult for the network to secure that device. But from, a, from an IoT perspective, you know, if a, if a sensor, uh, as my boss says, your Nest thermostat should never order a book from Amazon, right? It's, it's very, very clear what the Nest thermostat does. It talks to one destination on the network in a very predictable manner same size payloads, same you know, encrypted traffic going to the same destination. And when it deviates from that, it's very, very obvious to the network. And so when you take a 50 cent sensor and you, you look at how do I secure this, the best answer is let the network do it. Right? Let the network secure that and provide it a very, very narrow path to the rest of the network and to the internet without letting it get exposed to some random hackers using a script that take, took over a bunch of devices back last year. Right? So. Maybe add to it as well. From the from the market dynamics perspective, in addition to the technology and, and uh, sort of scale challenges that uh, Sean and John talked about, 
Uh, there's also a transition uh, we definitely have seen, especially on the industrial side, from what we sort of uh, jokingly call uh, security by obscurity. So people sort of uh, assuming that their plant is secure by just not being connected to the network. And obviously that approach has been shattered with uh, Stuxnet and also uh, by using basic tools, uh, companies discovering that yes, there are actually 20 VPNs going into my uh, plant, right, from vendors and, uh, and contractors and so forth. More into the ar architectural approach, right, uh, before, during, and after policy-based approach. Um, my sense is that industry has been there before, not at the same scale though. Like, if you remember 15 years ago, we had a similar problem with Wi-Fi, consumer Wi-Fi devices being, um, being uh, or clients being attached to MRI machines, right, and bad things happen. The difference though is, as, as um, we've talked about, it's a question of scale, it's a question of amount of data, it's a question of heterogeneity of end devices that I think is unique. Yep. So, uh, so you know, we talked a lot about uh, IOX. We talked about uh, the IoT Data Connect platforms, different standards that are needed, like MUD manufacturers' usage description, rolls right off your tongue, um, and uh, and things that are needed. Now, we also have Jasper. So, uh, so Jasper has been an important part of uh, Cisco's portfolio in IoT. Um, Lionel, can you tell us a little bit about Jasper or Sean? Um. Yes. I'm actually I'm part of a Jasper organization, believe it or not. Um, so uh, one, one of the main things we're actually doing with Jasper is connectivity management. So you, being able to actually take a car manufacturer and saying, hey, or even a Kindle, right? Say, hey, you need to connect this thing to the internet. How do you actually do that at scale? How do you actually, the worst thing is for me from an IoT point of view, when I'm deploying stuff out in the field, when something goes wrong, how do I actually get visibility into that? And one of the things we actually provide with Jasper is real proper in-depth troubleshooting down to the SIM card level itself to say, hey, where's this device been? What service does it run? Uh, do I want to enable a new service maybe? Also, what's the signal strength been on that card for the last X amount of time? A couple of other things we can do is say, hey, if you actually move outside of this location, send an alert. You know, it goes back to, well, the light bulb is a light bulb and the light bulb shouldn't be moving well, this thing probably shouldn't be moving either a lot of the times. And if it actually moves, trigger and actually execute some policies in the back end as well. And then obviously from anybody that's actually worked with any sort of cellular contracts or anything like that, it's actually pretty complex to go in and solve all the billing, all the data usage um, from an estate management point of view. So when I say estate SIM cards, you know, actually managing that whole portfolio is pretty complex. And if you have different providers in different countries, how do you actually centrally control that and manage that? And that's what we as Jasper do very well, is being able to give you that control, giving the customer control back of all their sims and data and everything like that from a central location. No, that was good. I, I, I will add to it anyway. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that last piece is really key, right? When, when you start deploying a product worldwide that uses cellular connectivity and you try to integrate with the carriers, Every one of these carriers has homegrown systems. They, they have their own back-end systems for doing all of the business processes of managing the life cycle uh, and the troubleshooting and, and the billing and the provisioning, right? And, and all of these pieces start to become increasingly more complex as you add more and more carriers. And Jasper provides a single unified API and platform to manage that across hundreds of carriers uh, throughout the world. And so, just, just that simple piece by itself, uh, or seemingly simple piece, uh, is, is a huge value proposition for Jasper. So. Can you talk about one or two of the customers that are using Jasper? Yeah, I mean there's a million of them. Uh, I think we're now at 8,500 customers. Shouldn't say a million, but 8,500 8, customers. Uh, grows by a couple hundred a month. Um, some of the big ones, GM, so if you look at General Motors with their OnStar system, uh, General Motors manages all of the cellular connectivity through Jasper. Uh, Coca-Cola is another big customer, so uh, I don't know if we're getting them here in Europe, but Coca-Cola is in the U.S. deploying these new machines that have 50 different flavors and a touch screen and you can make cherry Coke or grape Coke or whatever you want out of it. They, they actually use uh, cellular connectivity to manage that device for the location and so when, the, when it starts running low on a syrup, they'll roll out a truck to put new grape syrup in it or Coca-Cola syrup or Dr. Pib or whatever they sell, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. So, you know, they they uh, the, the managing the cellular connectivity of these boxes that are in you know hundreds of thousands of restaurants around the world 
uh, is a huge complex problem for them and Jasper makes it significantly easier for them to do that. So. Yeah, there's times when uh, you know the best connectivity you have is cellular because you don't know where a car is going to go, so where you don't know where the vending machine is going to be placed. Um, speaking back in the world of cars, so uh, so John, you have some work going on in connected cars. Why don't you share with the with the audience what you're doing there? Sure. So uh, as you know, the connected cars is really getting more and more exciting. There's a lot of talk today with uh, autonomous vehicles, with Uber and so forth. So there, there are actually many different types of connectivity that matter there. They're actually a foundational. We just talked about the car to the cloud sort of connectivity, right? Which is using cellular. Okay. Another thing is the connectivity within the car itself. Most cars today have basically analog networks or digital point-to-point -point networks and we're moving that to Ethernet and IP based network within the car. And as you know, there are, about a, there are over a hundred different compute little engines in a car, from embedded units to x86s to NVIDIA. So there's a lot of capability there, and we're moving to a really fully networked, deterministic network and uh, uh, setup there. Some of you may have seen or heard at CES that Cisco and Hyundai had an announcement about how we're working with Hyundai to make their next generation in-car network. So that's the in-vehicle thing. There's also the vehicle to cloud, which we talked about. And the third is also the vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure. Much of this uses 802.11p, which is a variant of Wi-Fi. It's called DSRC. Uh, basically, it's a, a short range, uh, highly reliable uh, wireless communication. And what you can do here is that it's very useful for safety. If the car ahead of you slams on the brakes, it can tell everybody, can broadcast to everybody, say, hey, I'm slamming on the brakes. So you, your car can hear it and can start uh, um, doing the right thing, for example, slowing down immediately. Also, you can connect with the stoplights and so forth. That's example of the infrastructure side. And a lot of ties in with smart city. Some interesting examples are, for instance, for uh, trucking. You may often see two trucks going near each other, going down the highway. The reason they do that is they can save a lot of gasoline or a lot of diesel if they go close together. Turns out you can reduce your gasoline usage by 9% if you caravan, 9%. Now to do that though safely, you want these trucks, which are really big and heavy, to be very aware of what's happening in the surroundings and to be able to break together so no accidents. And by having vehicle to vehicle communication, as soon as the first car uh, truck starts breaking, all the other trucks can also start breaking at the same time. And that's how you can dramatically improve the safety of these convoying and make it much more fuel efficient. So a lot of things happening within the vehicle, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, and of course vehicle to cloud. That's cool, right? <laughs> Very cool. Uh, uh, Machik, so uh, you, work, you uh, run our innovation centers around the world, and then in our innovation centers you're bringing in startups and you know, bringing in a lot of different types of people together to think about the new uh, areas. How are your innovation centers helping in addressing IoT? It goes back to, I think, what Sean, you talked about, which is about business outcomes, right? And what, we have nine innovation centers across the globe, uh, one in Berlin here, like 20 minutes away, open Berlin, and what we do in the innovation centers is uh, get together with the customer, with partners, with startups, and co-develop solutions together. Not custom solutions, but solutions that we can then replicate. Um, and again, this is a key to uh, adoption of IoT from our perspective, is moving from technology out sort of approach that we, we uh, that as industry we've been uh, sort of operating uh, in the 90s into customer in, uh, starting with, uh, with a customer problem statement, um, as, as we've talked about, and um, and developing a solution that uh, then we can scale and, uh, and uh, deploy with hundreds of customers. So these are basically the labs uh, the, where we co-innovate with customers, partners, and startups. So if you are interested in working with us, uh, please talk to me and we can, uh, we can figure out how we can work together. Do you have any good examples of some innovations that came out of some of these? Absolutely, I think there's a, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, let's think about uh, uh, the work that we've done with a company called Relayer. Um, so it's a startup here locally in, the, in the Berlin. Uh, they won the, gr um, uh, the gr grand challenge that we ran for innovations in, uh, in IoT, I think two years ago. And uh, I think we had around uh, 1,200 participants and they were number one. 
So we liked them to the point when we were standing up the Innovation Center, we actually invited them to help us um, sort of orchestrate the intelligent building uh, as part of the Innovation Center. What they do is they basically pull together a bunch of sensors and, uh, and allow them all to work together. And then eventually we ended up um, investing in them and now we're working with dozens of customers on the joint solutions. So uh, let me ask you all, so we're here on the DevNet zone, and clearly the DevNet zone is to help uh, enable developers and have people uh, learn to use APIs. It's also for helping operators uh, to learn to run these systems because they're big software systems at the end of the day. So the question is, there's all different kinds of developers. There's like web front end engineers, there's mobile device developers, networking platform engineers. So uh, what's the role of developers in IoT? And I think everybody will have, there's so many layers of the stack. So what are the roles of different developers and how can developers get involved? So I, can, I can jump in first. Um, as I said, as I was talking about it, developers are key for us with respect to, I think whether it's partners who closely work with us or customers who develop software for themselves. And we are giving enough tools. Uh, I, I, you know, I strongly uh, recommend you to go and search uh, IOX in uh, DevNet. What it does is, it, like, you know, providing this uh, development tools, you can develop applications and try it on our sandbox. You don't need to buy a box yet. So you can try it on sandbox. That way you know what is the potential and what kind of innovation you can make. And at that point, you'll be able to deploy it in real box, real hardware, and you'll be able to connect to the cloud and it'd make a difference for your own companies or you can may build for your partners. So, uh, Sri Krish, if you have your, uh, your IOX, right, so on the edge you can write an app for IOX. Yes. How will a developer write an app for IOX? So that's, a, that's a good <laughs> question. I think, so we, we want to make it very, very easy for you, right? You'll be able to, whatever language you know, you know Python, Node.js, uh, Java, or if you're familiar with C, it's great, right? Any, any of these things, you can use very much like, you know, the Docker environment. If you know Docker, that's all we care, right? That's a, everyone knows Docker in this, in this new world. So if you know Docker, you'll be able to build your application in the exact same way, and the last step, we will give a tool which will convert and make it run, right? So you don't have to know uh, like a lot of new technologies. You know, you should know what what is already there in the market, and that should be enough for us. Excellent, excellent. So you can just write your Docker container. You yes, can put your app Docker into a container. Docker container, yes. and then have it run on the edge of the network. Yes. Very good. Other so, areas for developers? Yes. Oh, um, so to me, in in the world I live in, at least, uh, the developer is actually the king. So yeah. what? What we as Cisco actually deliver is a framework, right? We, we enable you guys, the developers, to actually go and sell the business outcome. Nobody's going to go to a customer and say, oh, I want an IOX. It just doesn't happen. I want an application that does something, and we as Cisco will help you get there. You know, we'll help you develop the application. It's the same. Nobody says, hey, I want an IoT data connect. They actually want to be able to run business intelligence on top of the data, and that's exactly where the developers come in again. They go and write the applications that consume these data sets. They write the applications that connect to all these millions of different types of machines. They write the applications that add that intelligence layer down at the edge as well. So developers in the stack we live in, they've got so many functions they can do. I work with so many innovative companies as well, and we try and enable and try and find those new market adjacencies. A lot of times I walk around the world of solutions, I'll find a new partner, and I'll think, they'll talk to me and say, oh, I'm thinking of doing this, and I'm like, oh, I didn't think of doing that. You know, because there's so many different iterations we can have on one single solution as well. So, yeah, I think that a that lot. Well, look, at what you mentioned is key, right? IoT is not a one market, it's a collection of markets, and you really need to, whether you like it or not, to be successful as a developer, you need to go vertical, you need to become experts in examples you've mentioned, right? It is uh, um, what are the key carryabouts of a person who runs the plant or who runs the uh, logistic system. And um, so in some way, yes, we are horizontal in terms of using modern tools. We vertical from the business understanding and business outcome perspective. Yeah. Well, from this perspective, uh, what do you think are, so we have a number of partners, right? So partners who are building solutions for customers. So what do you think are some of the most lucrative or promising areas that you believe some of our partners should invest in in the world of IoT? I mean, from the market perspective, my sense is, and the use case perspective, 
is there's a sort of a level of, of complexity, but also the reward. Uh, probably what some of the easiest use cases would be remote asset management, remote monitoring, that uh, a lot of customers have been starting because you can do it uh, fairly straight, in a fairly straightforward way. Uh, probably more complex, but also I would say rewarding are um, our preventive maintenance solutions because, uh, and again, you think about the, the use cases are powerful, right? If you think about mine, every time the big truck that is in the open pick mine it doesn't work, it costs the company $2 million, right? So developing a preventive maintenance solution, which by the way requires a lot of vertical knowledge, um, is, uh, is a very lucrative and very uh, uh, a big ROI item for the customers. So. I'll probably start with a couple of these sort of uh, um, increased complexity, but also increased reward kind of use cases. Yeah, I, and I would just extend that by you know continuing on your prior thought, which is know your vertical really well, right? I mean, if, if the the better you understand your vertical, and the more you understand that business outcomes that your customers are looking for, the the easier it will be for you to connect the dots between the sensors and the actuators to actually produce that outcome for your customer. Yeah, just one last one. Don't overcomplicate this. It's, you know, it, it's really easy from an IoT point of view to think, oh, I've got this multi-million dollar machine that's doing all these crazy things. You know where we are right now? A lot of these guys are actually just saying, hey, if you can tell me if that light is on, and this other machine can see that that light is on, solve that problem for me. A lot of these challenges are super simple to go and solve, and you could step straight in as long as you become the expert within their industry. And one of the other things is, if you're new to that market, these guys want to tell you everything about everything that they do. So just listen, be humble, sit, listen, and try and think outside the box and think, oh, what you really need is the following, and that is actually super simple to do. Great advice. Nice uh, Shri Krish, any final words for the audience? So the one, one thing I, I hear from this, uh, you know, the easy entry point, going back to your point about it, the easy entry point to me is uh, taking open source. There are a lot of open source uh, available taking it and applying it to IoT market. Actually, IoT market in some sense is brand new and a lot of the things are coming up. Like, we have seen that happening, right? In manufacturing sector, people took MT Connect agent and just ported it to IOX, uh, ported into, sorry, I I IoT. Suddenly, you know, you solved a problem for like a lot of the large range of customers. So taking it s s simple steps, I think going back to Leonel's point, taking a simple step, taking an existing problem and solving it for customers is a key here. Excellent. Uh, John, any final comments for the audience? Well, here you have a great opportunity to learn much more about all of this. If you go to the world of solutions, you can learn about IOX, about some IoT cloud stuff. Over here, you can see demos. If you go to the learning labs, you can start seeing the, the APIs to use IOX and so forth, and for some of the security technology. So I really encourage you to take the time here to go see these demos, look at the world of solutions, come talk with us, tell us what you're interested in, tell us what you want to learn about, and we very much would like to work with you to, uh, to make this successful. Great, excellent. So uh, thank you everybody for, for joining us. Um, so as we said, uh, you know, I think if I'd summarize the panel, the promise of IoT has really been you know, there for a long time, but it sounds like there's a lot of progress in the last year to really making it real. Um, we have new platforms that are coming out, things like IoT Data Connect, to allow you to you know, manage some of the data, make sure it's not all in the cloud, you have stuff on site so that you can use uh, some of the applications reliably. We have IOX to do edge processing, to be able to really collect all of that data. You have low latency processing right on the edge. Uh, we, uh, we, have a, we have a lot of work in terms of uh, you know, security standards, different IOT standards to make the industry coming together. Uh, we also have our innovation centers in which our innovation centers are bringing together startups, you know, academia, big companies to make some of these things happen. Um, Jasper helps out, we're with you know, IOT, you're going to have many types of devices that are connected that are, you know, best accessed through a cellular network. Um, here in the DevNet zone, we have this uh, smart city and transportation over here, so you can see some use cases. There's a number of co-creations over there. There's a project called DevIoT, which is a developer, a drag and drop developer environment for connecting together IOT applications, which is in the co-creations area of the DevNet zone. And then also over there, we have some learning labs with a train running in the middle. It turns out there's sensors connected up to that train. You can walk up to the learning lab and go ahead and program a policy to say when the train gets here, make the traffic light turn red, you know, or make it stop and make it honk its horn. 
So uh, there's a lot for you to do in very kind of hands-on ways. I encourage you to write your first IoT app and make your first REST call over there in the learning labs. Um, but thank you to our uh, wonderful guests here and our, our leaders within Cisco that are leading the charge in IoT to make it all real. And thank you for joining us, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.